a young, a young child of four to five can tell stories and communicate with people outside of their family. So think about that, especially if you're starting out super early with your child. Um, our children have a little more difficulty with learning skills anyway, but if you think about those you know, basic milestones for language, um, a three-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old, you know, they're not gonna be having conversations yet. So um, don't get discouraged if, if, they're, if they don't take off doing that. Um, so next we're gonna move on to your behavior we'll need to change to. So one of our biggest challenges was, you know, Emma had been without a communication device for so many years that we had started communicating with her and learning her communication cues, kind of like what Gilbert was saying about her grandson, you know, rubbing his arm or his leg. We just knew, we knew what she was saying. We knew what she wanted. She used her eyes a lot to let us know what she needed and wanted. So we kind of had to retrain ourselves and not just automatically give her what we knew she wanted and really encourage her to use her device to tell us. Um, because if they can keep doing it the way they've been doing it and still get what they need, then why, you know, why would they try something different? Um, <laughs> I did want to say that we found that there had to be a happy balance there though, because um, you didn't want to try and force her only to use her device because that really frustrated her a lot where, you know, I mean, when you think about if, if someone were to say, well, now you have to communicate in a completely different way than you've been communicating your whole life just overnight. So it was, it was a lot of modeling at first, just us saying, Hey, you can use this as a different way to communicate. And when she kind of realized, Hey, that's a little bit easier than what I've been doing, then she wanted to use it. So you have to, you kind of have to balance it out a little bit. Okay, um, so like I said, um, if, if your child does not yet have a device, I would encourage you to kind of document how you're communicating with your child and how they're communicating with you. That'll just make you a little more conscious of what are we doing before the device, you know, what's been working for us before that. If your child does have a device, then just pay attention, you know, to what you're reacting to, um, how they're getting their wants and needs met, and if you're encouraging them to use that device to tell you rather than just doing what's always worked. Um, patience, <laughs> you're gonna need a lot of it. Um, communicating with a device will require more processing time, especially if they're just starting. So don't give up if they don't respond right away. Like I said, say something and then kind of leave just this empty space, you know, like uh, what movie do you want to watch, right? And you're giving them choices or you have the pictures on the device, you know, a picture of the, the, the two movies and they have to choose one. Give them some time. Um, I would say most of the time, Emma might even take a good 30 seconds, especially in like a conversation with someone that she's not familiar with. She takes a lot of time. And so I have to remind people, you know, just let her, let her think about it. Think about what she wants to say. Um, and that can be hard, but you can kind of tell if you watch them, you know, that she's like thinking, she's trying to figure out what she wants to say. Um, and they, there's a lot of navigating on the device, you know, so that takes time to, to find what, what she's looking for. Um, believe in yourself, in your child. You know, go into this believing that it's going to work and that they can do it and you can do it too. Um, you're going to have some really discouraging days and that some of you probably already have. And you're going to wonder if your child is capable of it. And I firmly believe they are. I, I believe that eye gaze is the best form of communication for our STXers. And, you know, when Leela says that Rowan jumped right into that and did it that quickly, we know how challenging everything is for them. For some reason, you know, whatever's going on in their brain, that eye gaze 
isn't quite as challenging as other things are for them. So um, it is hard to talk some speech therapists into that. We, I actually had it out with our rep, you know, when we first tried eye gaze with Emma, she tried to talk me out of it and tried to talk me into all kinds of other stuff. And I just, I actually had watched Paul. Paul was kind of the pioneer in uh, Paul and Stephanie in eye gaze and he was doing amazing with it. And I was just like, no, this is what she needs. And so you just, if you know that you need to stand firm, you need to um, insist on an evaluation and, and like Leela said, you know, your child is probably going to blow them away if they do it properly and they put things in front of them, like games or things that are motivating for them, they're going to do really well with it. And hopefully that will be enough to convince them. But, but it is, it is still a challenge. It's still a fairly new area, you know, that they're not using with kids like ours because they see our kids and they think CP you know, or they think um, a similar disorder that's able to choose buttons or, you know, push a Big Mac. And um, we know that fine motor is just really challenging for our kids. So um, I just want to encourage you to not back down. <laughs> you know, if, if this is what you really want for your child, you're, you might have to fight for it, but it will be worth it. Can I just, okay. say, can I say one yeah. thing about the eye gaze real quick? Um, I, the eye gaze, like the Toby Dynavox that I know that, that Lila had mentioned earlier, you do have the option of using eye gaze and touch. So it can mm -hmm. work either way. So if your child is able to work on touching something, they have the ability to do both with the eye gaze. So that is wow. nice. Yeah. That is nice to keep in mind that you're not, it's not strictly just eye gaze. You do have the ability to use touch as well. And, and that might even um, be easier, you know, to talk, talk them into working with your child with that, you know, if it's not just solely eye gaze, but okay. So we're going to move on to start out slow and fun, just as you would with a toddler. So it's really tempting not to just jump right in. Um, we just want to be able to talk with our child. We want them to call us mommy and we want to hear their thoughts. But using a communication device not only requires understanding the words they hear on a regular basis, informing thoughts or responses, they then have to go the extra mile and find that icon slash word on their device and look at it long enough to make the choice. And then there's also some processing, you know, in the brain that has to happen to to plan that out. Um, I don't know how the, you know, how having changes in the STXBP1 gene um, impacts those tasks, but I'm gonna guess it does make it a little more difficult than for most. So just be patient and kind of hold yourself back um, in the beginning. So when our kids are small, when they're toddlers, we play with them, we listen to music, we read books, the nursery rhymes. We tend to be pretty silly and animated, over animated with them. Um, and we found that that really worked with Emma. And it still does sometimes, you know, sometimes she rolls her eyes at me and she's not in the mood, but for the most part, that still works with her. So um, those things kind of tend to fade away naturally as our, our kids get older and language develops. And so when you're introducing this, definitely start out being fun and silly because really that's, what matters to our kids the most. Um, so music, rhymes, keeping it lighthearted, the fun games, you know, that they use during the evaluation. I think it's like popping bubbles or popping the balloons. Um, Emma really liked that in the beginning. She never plays those games now because she would rather talk. <laughs> but in the beginning, she played them a lot and we let her play them as often as she wanted to. Um, because that was part of her, you know, kind of building a connection with her device as her own. Um, so another thing is that we kind of had to train ourselves to do was no matter what that device was in front of her. And when you're not used to putting it on their stroller or on their wheelchair, it's easy to just not do it. And I still have to remove it to get her out of her chair. 
and move it to put her in her chair. You know, so it's it's an extra step. Um, but no matter what, that device is in front of her. It's it is her voice, so she has access to it. As long as she's awake, she has access to it. Um, this will also, like if you're doing dishes or, you know, if they're on their own, that gives them the freedom to explore their device too and kind of navigate the different pages and figure out, you know, what is this all about? And, and it's a more light heart hearted environment, you know, for, for them to explore it rather than like in a very structured environment. And we're only gonna use this for you to say yes and no, and let me know what you want. You know, it's, it's just, it's a little more freedom for them to do with it what they want. Um, so another, so at school, um, in the beginning, we really stressed this in her IEP, you know, that they, that device would be in front of her at all times. We had a hard time, um, with them wanting to use it in the beginning for school yeah. purposes or, you know, controlling how she used yeah, it. Nice. And that, and we did too at home. And that really caused a problem. Um, she actually went on strike for about a year after we got the device and would not look at it. Um, we, we were really, really discouraged. So we had to then kind of, okay, let's, let's think about this, you know, like how, how can we get her to use this? And so I would say, you know, whatever you need to do to make sure school is is doing it the way that you feel like it needs to be done in the beginning, you know, add it to the IEP. Um, I we, think one of the things I remember with school that they found she really enjoyed was um, that they would let her use it during games. And she would, she also, they let her kind of uh, be the one that bossed the kids around a little bit. <laughs> Um, so they would, she would say, you know, guys, it's time to clean up or, or, you know, now it's your turn or, and she really, really enjoyed that. So it's really about, hopefully your, your school staff will be willing to uh, work with you and kind of explore what kinds of things does she enjoy using this for? Because one of the things that we did use it a lot for was calendar and she really just didn't enjoy that. <laughs> she, we, we would do it. But it would, we would get to the point where we would just be like, yeah, we're just going to, we're pulling this up. But if you don't want to do it, it's okay. Um, you know, because it's the way that I thought about it was, you know, there are certain topics that I enjoy talking about and there are certain topics that I don't enjoy talking about. And so if someone was constantly trying to force me to talk about something that I wasn't interested in, I'm not going to enjoy it and I'm probably not going to participate. So if you can kind of work alongside your teachers and your staff, you know, to, try and find those key things that your kid kind of enjoys, you know, whether it's bossing around the other kids or, you know, during a game, then that's going to make all the difference for them using it. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think this, they ended up putting like the weather and calendar on the smart board and she really, really liked the smart board. So once they did that, she was more willing to participate in like, what is the weather today? And sometimes she would choose the opposite of what it was to be funny. Um, and, but she, she does usually enjoy talking about the weather. So um, yeah, just like Naomi said, you know, finding something that interests them and making that their, you know, their task at school and everyone, you know, listens to what they have to say or, and, you know, sometimes she wouldn't choose anything at all. Or like I said, would choose the wrong thing, but it was always like, if she did say something, it was acknowledged they, and they made a big deal about it. Um, we started out pretty slow. We started out with only 18 icons on her device. Um, and we actually noticed that she did better with more when we added more to it. I think that's probably something you're going to have to play around with because um, it could be a little overwhelming at first. But I think for Emma, she was just kind of like, 
you know, she navigated it so well that we were almost limiting her by only keeping, you know, a, that small of amount on there. Um, but this is also the same time that we added, when we increased the number of icons was around the same time that we also added music and fun things to it, you know, so maybe that was what really motivated her. But I would say that's something that you're going to have to figure out for your child. You can start with a small amount and see how they do. They may get bored with it pretty quickly, though. Um, many um, Allison, Allison Smith asked a question oh. in the chat. Um, she said, we don't really have a good way to attach Isaac's device to his wheelchair. Are there any resources for attachments? We have a gooseneck clamp, but it isn't good for the wheelchair. Which, oh. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So when we got Emma's, um, you should be able to get it from that company. Who, wherever you got your device from, they should have attachments that would work with his chair. Yeah, I would say if you have a rep that you're working with, our rep was absolutely amazing. Like she, she just was constantly answering all of our questions. Um, but she directed us to an actual website from that company that we could, we were able to get, you know, I mean, they just had such a selection of different options for attachments, you know, whether it was floor attachments or, uh, you know, tray attachments or for your wheelchair. I mean, it was just insane. The, yeah. You know, of options. It I was through PRC. So I don't know if you use PRC, um, but they have, they definitely have a lot more options for that kind of stuff. Um, Allison, I have some other questions for you, so I'll I'll either send you a message afterwards, or we can talk about it at the end a little bit more. But I just have some questions about it um, that might help us find an answer for you. Um, okay, so many devices will actually allow you to take pictures with them. Um, if you can't, you can still take a picture and upload it to the device. But we when we really wanted Emma to start using it, we took pictures of ourselves. We took pictures of the important people in her life and those were put on her device with the, that person's name. Um, we took pictures of her toys, her favorite toys, took pictures of her movies that she liked and her books. Um, and those pictures went straight onto her device because those were things that she recognized. Those were things that mattered to her. And so instead of using icons or just a generic, you know, I want to read a book, she had pictures of the books that she really likes to read so she can tell us, you know, which one she wants. Um, I would also suggest using, like, if you have a, a funny name that you call a pet or a funny name that, you know, that people in the family call someone, use that because she just you know like our kids are ornery and she she likes that kind of stuff um so I would suggest doing that for them we also did an opinion page so that opinion page says have a nice day um it says uh that's dumb I don't like that no thank you whatever it, it's a little bit sassy and she uses that page a lot <laughs> So, um, I, you know, I would encourage doing something like that because our kids, you know, if they were typical kids, they would definitely be saying no and I don't like that or, you know, that's dumb. Um, and so in the beginning, you really want to just keep those pages basic and things that they will recognize, you know, like the pictures of family members. Um, when you talk to them, I would suggest, like, let's say they choose a picture of the teddy bear. Yeah, that's your teddy bear, you know, teddy bear. Just saying, repeating what they say so that they know you heard them, you know what they're saying. Maybe go pick up the teddy bear and bring it to them. Do you want your teddy bear? you know, have a full-blown conversation about that one choice. Um, and that, that's going to help them learn the connection between that icon 
and you know what what they're asking for. Oh yeah, okay. So when I do that, I get my teddy bear. Um, and you, so when they do choose to say something, and in the beginning, Emma just kind of would randomly say things. Always, always acknowledge that they said something. You, you know, sometimes she would choose a lot of things that didn't really make sense, but. We still, we still made a big deal about it. Um, Naomi was really, really good at figuring out what she actually meant. And it usually did have something to do with, you know, something that was going on at that time. Um, but just always acknowledge if they say anything at all. We actually um, went a little overboard in the beginning, you know, and made a huge deal about it when she would say something because we were just so excited that she was using the device. Um, and so again, just repeating back what they say, you know, and having basically having a conversation about whatever it was. Yeah, and I think that one of the things Jen and I had talked about was that uh, it's important, especially once your kid has kind of gotten to the place where they are a little bit like more fluent, maybe, you know, using it a little bit more regularly, to um not just disregard the random words that they say because like jen said um there were a lot of times when and and again it's it's that patience thing you have to take the time to really think about okay what's the context of what's going on here you know maybe you're at a doctor's office or maybe you know they they might be hungry or something might be going on that you're not really thinking about but the word that they say actually does apply to that. So it's kind of broadening your uh, perspective on the situation so that you can kind of see what might they be talking about. And sometimes it feels like you're maybe, <laughs> I don't know, making things up. But then when you actually really think about it, you're like, oh, that actually makes perfect sense. And you're just really excited because they actually used a word in context that you just hadn't noticed for yourself. So uh, just don't ever, like Jen said, don't disregard anything that they say. Like, even if it doesn't make sense, um, sometimes I think she just is experienced or experimenting with new words. And that's awesome too. You know, even if that's all she's doing. And so it's, it's all, all of it is part of the growth process. So yeah, uh, lately she's been choosing this and that a lot. And it's just, that's all she says, this. <laughs> and I don't know what she means by that, but it obviously means something to her because she keeps saying it. And so I'll just say, you know, if we're in school and her teacher has, you know, a book, I'll say, yeah, do you mean this book, you know? And I, I don't know if that's what she means, but I'm just showing her what that could look like in a sentence, you know, so, or in when she's talking about something that this and that are typically paired with something else. And I'm not, you know, teaching her that the way that we would teach another typical child that, but by modeling that for her, it, it is teaching her that. And so hopefully she eventually starts pairing this and that with, you know, whatever she's talking about. Um, uh, one thing I noticed, and I mean, I think Naomi and I always did it intentionally, but it wasn't something I really realized. We ran into her elementary school teacher who Emma did, that's when she really started using her communication devices school was with this particular teacher. And I noticed right away that when she talked to Emma, she talked to her and anticipated Emma saying something. So like if we run into someone we know and we say hi to them, we act like we expect an answer, right? We, we don't expect that they're gonna ignore us or they're not going to say something worth um, hearing. And so when this teacher talked to Emma, she talked to her like she, she knew she was, Emma was going to say something. You know, she assumed that Emma had something to say. And so that is one thing that we have always done with her. If we talk to her, we wait like we're expecting her to say something to us. And all of the people that she, her doctors, you know, whoever it is that she chooses to communicate with, it's because 
they waited during that waiting period after saying something to her they made eye contact with her they were engaged with her and she knew that they actually cared about whatever it was that she had to say um other people who are a little bit artificial and you know not very genuine about like saying something to her and then just kind of like going on to the next thing she will not talk to those people and sometimes it can be a little frustrating but at the same time I can understand why she doesn't so it it is important to 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 let your child know that you know that they have things to say and you are really interested in whatever that is and I mean we all are but you know just thinking about those nonverbal cues if we're like busy doing something or just slowing down and and making sure you know that they know that you are you're with them um we all know that our kids love a reaction so when like i said when they choose to use their device especially in the beginning you're going to lose your mind and you're going to overreact and you're going to act like you just won the lottery. <laughs> um, even now, every time Emma says mommy, if I am across the house, like I come running. And she knows that when she says that, um, that she, it's going to get a reaction. Um, and she she doesn't overuse it, even knowing that. But when when she does use it, she's looking at the doorway when as I come in, like, I knew, you know, I knew that you were going to come when I said that. So, um, and that is because I did definitely overreact when she said mommy because, uh, yeah, um, she was like 11, I think, before I heard her say mommy for the first time. So I had been waiting a really, really long time for that. Um, so repeating, um, repeating what they say goes along with the modeling, as I said. Um, so, you know, like if, if your child isn't yet using their device, you pick up one of their favorite toys, um, find it on their device, you know, say what the toy is, push the button um, to repeat so that they can recognize that toy goes with that picture on my device. Um, at this point, Emma doesn't appreciate us doing that. You know, she really doesn't want us touching her device, but when she was first learning, I think it helped her know, you know, where all the different things were. And even now, the only time I do really touch it is to take her to her body part page. If, you know, she's not feeling well, and I really want her to tell me, um, what's bothering her. But other than that, um, in the beginning, we did a lot of that. We did a lot of kind of showing her where things were. Um, there are, to go back to the reaction, uh, there are some things that she says or does that she knows annoys me. And that's because she wants that reaction. And so even though it's annoying, um, I give her like a playful, annoyed reaction, which she really likes. And that's like our little back and forth like teasing and game and it's a form of communication right so it helps me know um, her personality she's obviously in a playful mood and um, it's just kind of this fun little thing that we have with each other so um okay so let's move on to make the device your child um Emma was using her device fairly well when we discovered her love of men with deep voices and so we had a little girl voice on her device and all devices have this. So you can play around with the voices just like you can on a GPS. And so we found a deep man's voice and we were like, let's try it. <laughs> and I actually found the video of our first time trying it with her. And she was like, play, play, play. And, and Naomi and I were losing it. Um, and she actually did start using her device more after we changed it to that because she liked the deep man's voice. And so to this day, she still has a deep man's voice <laughs> on her device. Um, so 
you know, think about that kind of stuff. Uh, play around with the voices. I love it. I love yeah. it. I love it. <laughs> um, you can play around yeah, with the voices. Cool. Yeah, it's also cool when we when we take her places and it always startles people. <laughs> but then we get the opportunity to explain to them, you know, she really likes that, you know, the deep voice. And it, and it immediately, you can see people just open up like, oh, wow, she really understands a lot more than we would have given her credit for. And so it, like those little things just kind of, it's, it's exciting to get to share that with people who don't know her and who might make yeah. assumptions based off of, you know, she's in a wheelchair or, you know, whatever. And um, I want those, please. yes. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so it's, it's just, you know, one of those, you can use those kind of opportunities to show hey this is my kid has a personality my kid is unique and special you know and really understands a lot more than people credit for did yeah. did did it just capture what she said she said i like boys please she yeah. said i want toys i want toys please oh okay i'm like am you i don't really, anything about is that really what you just said but <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I love it, Emma. I love it. Um, so you can also add funny noises to icons, which we did especially a lot in the beginning because our kids, you know, like those silly noises. Um, you, you know, you could do different noises with yes and no, or stop none. and go. Um, none? You don't have any? Have a nice day. <laughs> um, so, and, and then they'll learn, you know, that that particular sound is associated with, you know, that choice. Um, but that is one way to kind of encourage them to use their device a little bit more too. You can um, change the size of the icons and the cursor. That was um, one thing that uh, Naomi picked on that the, picked up on that the cursor was pretty small. Um, it used to be just like an arrow, I think, right? A little arrow. And so they we changed it to a red hand and she was able to see that a lot better. Yeah. So that's another thing to pay attention to is the size of the icons and the cursor. Oh. Song. Play a song. Um, you can change background color, and then, as we that. said, you can that. Yeah. That. You like the background color change? You like that background color? Um, like we said, you can use real picture or pictures of actual items in their environment instead of the stock icon photos. Um, whatever helps your child claim this yeah, device nice as their voice um, and as their own and aids them in using it to communicate their wants, needs, and thoughts. I want toys, please. Um, Giggle master. You have it. You have it right here. You have it. Hey, Tammy, if you haven't left yet, thank you for, oh, I think she already left. Okay, I will reach out to Tammy. It was so good to meet her. All right. Yeah. Awesome. And we'll make sure to send the recording out to her as well so she can finish watching. All right. Um, think about sayings or pet names or even events. You know, if, if you guys, yes. Have, yes, if you guys have specific events that are important to your family, that's the kind of things that you would want to include on their device, things that are important to them and to their life. Um, so we're gonna move on to roll up those sleeves. So we've loved every one of Emma's speech therapists. Um, they are, they're amazing people, they adore her, and they really wanted the best for her, but none of them knew much about eye gaze. <laughs> and um, some of the tactics that a couple of them used were actually a little bit harmful. Um, so they, you know, especially in a school setting, the speech therapist, you know, they're, yeah, they're, they're on they. a timeline and they're very goal oriented and they have, you know, specific things on the IEP that they're working on. 
And so they they get a little bit pushy, you know, <laughs> they, they want to be able to check things off their list and say that they met that goal. And so it, it's been hard, I think, for all of the speech therapists we've had to kind of like let Emma do things at her own pace and um, not make Have it a nice day. Um, boring and like work. And so um, some of them have adapted really well and others had a harder time with it. But I mean, we still, they, they were great people, but it just, you're probably gonna have to definitely communicate things to them. You know, if you feel like um, your child isn't really progressing well with them, you might wanna, you know, talk to them about what, how, are, how does the session look? you know, with your child, how are they working on them using their device? And don't be afraid to, to say something. It, it, you know, like in our case, it may or may not make a difference, but um, I would definitely, since they're the ones working with your child, you don't, you don't want them to do something that is gonna discourage them from wanting to use their device. Um, we just, things really have to be fun with her. If, if we get too serious, Animal she home. probably is going to shut down. Animal home? Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> um, so if, if I wake her up and, you know, and get her I up. I want to play on the floor, please. Things are very lighthearted. Um, she's going to be much more communicative um, than if, you know, we're rushing to get to an appointment and I'm, I'm a little more serious than usual. And so um, pay attention to those kinds of things. You know, if your child isn't really communicating that much, maybe things have just been a little more serious than usual and they're not feeling it. Um, it doesn't, you know, it, it isn't a setback. It isn't, you know, it isn't permanent. Um, okay, so, um, it felt like Naomi and I definitely did most of, most of the work as far as figuring out this device and taking the initiative to contact the PRC rep to learn how to, you know, upload music or put certain things on it. Um, so I think you just, you can't wait for someone to do it for you. Because I have heard from a few of you that, you know, you're just not really getting a whole lot of help with it. And I think, unfortunately, there isn't a lot of experience with using eye gaze with, our, with kids like our kids. So I think you're going to have to be willing to reach out, um, be willing to say, hey, this is what I want to try with my child. How can we make that happen? And... If you have a speech therapist that does have experience with it, that's fantastic. Um, I, you know, I would tell them some of these suggestions and ask them what their thoughts are and how, you know, how they can help you get it set up for your child. Um, I think it's really important also to take some time to uh, just at least learn the basics of, you know, how to do some basic editing on their device because um, you know, like adding new icons or, you know, putting a specific picture of a person on an icon. Uh, unfortunately, Emma's device is actually one of the more complicated ones, I think. Um, they do have a new system, but her device, it for whatever reason, you know, for different reasons, it, it, we can't switch over to it right now. But um, if you have a system that hopefully is a little bit more uh, user-friendly, uh, definitely do not hesitate to mess around with it. Like it's, it's really no different than when we get a new phone or a new tablet or a new computer, you know, you kind of, you spend a little bit of time just messing around with it, kind of getting to know it. And that's the same thing that we have to do. You know, generally kids, when they get a new tablet or new electronic, they would be the ones to do that. Parents don't necessarily have to do that. But for us, you know, we, as the parents or the you know, caregivers have to be the ones that kind of get to know the ins and outs of how to, you know, edit just certain things. So don't be afraid or intimidated because it, it was definitely intimidating at first. <laughs> um, but I think because I spent a lot of time 
with Emma during like her naps and stuff, I was able to take that time. And I just like, I literally just pushed buttons <laughs> just to see what would happen. And, uh, you know, through watching some YouTube videos and um, definitely reaching out to the rep, uh, we kind of figured out the basics at least so that we could add the things that sh were personal to her without having to, you know, have someone, you know, have the rep in town or, you know, anything like that. It really opened up a whole new world for all of us to make the device more her own. And I reached out to other parents. Yes, very true. Definitely. Um, so again, I'm going to reiterate just being patient. Every child's going to have their own timeline um, when it comes to communicating and a lot of different things can factor into this. Um, I'll, I'm going to go ahead and share an example of a timeline um, of something with Emma, just to kind of keep things realistic for you guys. Have a nice day. Um, so a couple of years ago, we wanted her Playing. to get... Um, we wanted her to be able to tell us when a specific part of her body was bothering her. And this was, you know, during her bad period when she was really sick and we needed her to be able to tell, tell us that. So we started off by putting, um, body parts on her page and playing various games to help her learn those body parts. Um, then we connected those body parts to her feelings such as I feel, um, to that body part page. And so like. she would say, I feel it went to sick, hurt. Um, and then it would, it would go to, like. you know, and then she could also go to her body part page and, and tell us where. Um, again, we use various techniques to teach this and also modeled. Sometimes we would just go to her body part page and ask what hurt or what was bothering her. And I still do that. And then she chooses that body part. And we have been working on this diligently for two years. Nice. Um, a couple weeks ago, she told her brother that her chest hurt. And I think she was working on getting pneumonia. Her pulmonologist and I were ecstatic because it allowed us to make changes to her routine and avoid a hospitalization. It was, it's huge, Nine. but it also took two years of, of being really consistent and working hard on it. So when you start to wonder, you know, why isn't my child picking this up? Um, is it, are they going to be able to pick it up? Yes. It's just going to take time. Um, and hopefully, you know, they give you, um, some little bits of encouragement along the way, you know, when Emma learned those body parts and was able to accurately identify them, you know, that was encouragement for us to continue. Okay, you know, we just need to keep keep working on this. Um, and I imagine hearing that is probably both hopeful and daunting at the same time. <laughs> um, but you've also seen the stories I've shared of things that she has said, and um, every second of work has been worth it. Um, you know, for that one moment for her to be able to avoid a hospitalization, you know, because um, she told us that her chest was starting to bother her um, is very meaningful, very meaningful. So I promise that's, you it'll be worth it. That's incredible. I mean, yeah. it's absolutely incredible. Yeah. I mean, that's what most of us want our kids to be able to tell us, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um. And so for our yeah. last section, we're going to go to the tech tips. Um, and so, I and real quick, I had somebody ask if we could see if we could see her device at some point. So whenever you feel whenever you feel it's appropriate, I also have Alex's device here too. So if yours looks a little different than mine, we could maybe show them both. But when yeah. we get to a, when we get to a point that you feel is appropriate, okay. All right. Well, we're in our last section. So um, after this, I will happily show you her device. Um, so I did put in there that the device is not easy to navigate, and I have heard that from other parents. Um, I won't say any names, but a, a specific mom told me that she felt inept because she could not figure out the device. Um, you are not inept. I 
um, both of the devices that we had for Emma was pretty challenging and I still am clueless, which um, Emma takes advantage of frequently <laughs> and just enjoys watching me struggle. So um, like Naomi said, she spent a lot of time with that device. Well, and it, obviously we don't, as parents, we don't always have, you know, that kind of time. So um, if you are struggling with that, you're not alone and it is not you, it's the device. Yes. So um, I just, you know, definitely would take advantage um, of that rep, your rep um, of the tech. There's a tech line. I know we have a tech line that we can call. Um, like Naomi said, YouTube videos or another parent, if they have the same device that you do, you know, maybe you can be like, hey, I'd like to learn how to do this. You each could maybe take one thing and one of you could figure out one thing, you know, someone else could figure out another thing. That way it kind of breaks up um, how much time you're spending on the device. Um, back up the device. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Naomi, uh, my you. first go, I lost everything. Yes. Okay. And so I guess just expect to lose everything at least once, you know, right. you should just back it up when you, when you make changes to it, back it up because yeah. Well, yeah. and that was not something that they really stressed us, which I think that they should have, and they should have shown us from day one, this is how you back it up. So um, if they don't bring that up, put that on your top list of questions <laughs> to ask them, hey, can you show me how to back this up? How often should I be backing it up? You know, that kind of stuff. Um, honestly, if you just get into the habit of doing it pretty much every time you make any big changes to the device, I, that's what I would recommend. Just it's better to be safe than sorry, because if you're putting in all this time to make it personalized and make it, you know, yeah, you, you don't want to lose all that. <laughs> Um, if your device needs to be repaired or your child's device needs to be re repaired, insist the company provides a loaner. So, because that is your child's voice mm -hmm. and sometimes some repairs can take a really long time. So if you guys are, you know, really it, it, not at any point, do you want your child to be without that? It doesn't matter if they're not using it yet, if they, you know, are, use it every now and then, or if they're doing really well with it you do not want to be without that. We, I think we made that mistake the first time and they had her device for like two or three months um, and she had just started using it. And so it was, you know, we lost two or three months so that she could have been learning new things. So definitely make sure, usually they will just provide one for you. It is, but you will have to ask them and insist that they do that. So I just want to recap, believe in yourself and your child. You're going to have some really discouraging days and you're going to wonder if your child is capable and if you can help them. They are and you can. Um, I, I just, yeah, I think our kids have a lot to say and they just need a way to do it. So, um, you know, I, I'm happy to answer any questions or if any point, you know, you get stuck in the process, um, I'm available for you. You know, even if you just need to vent, um, I'm happy to do that. Um, we will, um, you know, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat and I'm going to go ahead and grab Emma's device or maybe turn her around because she probably won't appreciate me. So it. I have um, Willow um, is using TD Snap. Is that what Emma's using on her device? No. What is Emma using on her device? So Emma has, um, it is, I believe, LAMP, right? I, yeah. So yeah. I'm using TD Snap though. So, so Monica, I am using TD Snap on Alex's. So, you know, you and I are using the same thing. Mm -hmm. And it's all going to look a little different. I think, it, you know, th the process is, is similar, but it's going to look a little bit different from program to program. Yeah. And Emma has a lot on her device because yes. she, she's very good at navigating this device. 
Yeah, so this is her core page and every single one of those icons takes her to another page and some of those pages take her to even another page. Um, so she is, like I would say just recently, um, she is actually starting to put two books together. So like I stopped by, you know, at lunchtime when I left, she said to my sister, mommy working. So like she knew that I had gone back to work, um, but that, you know, those two choices are in completely different places. So she has to navigate multiple pages, you know, to, to make that sentence, you know, or that two word phrase. Mm -hmm. So Allison says she's also using TD Snap. So that's again, what I'm using. So I'll show mine in a minute, but anybody else have questions for Jen? Feel free to put them in the chat or you can go ahead and turn on your microphone and ask any questions. I think this has been so good and so encouraging. I, I think I've taken a ton of notes. I don't think you ever stop learning and ever stop like um, learning from your child, you know? Um, and just, I, I think this is great, Jen, too, to hear from another parent. And just to hear what you're doing and, and maybe it gives us some ideas. Like I've already written down a ton of things, like an opinions page. I have emotions, but I don't have opinions. I feel mm -hmm. like, you know, like maybe we should do opinions. Um, and then be a little bit passive. Yeah. And I love the idea of noises because Alex thinks certain noises are hilarious. Mm -hmm. And I'm already thinking about what noises I want to add on there and there may be one or two that are not appropriate. I'm just saying so, but he's <laughs> going to think they're hilarious. He, right. It's probably yeah. going to be his, it's probably going to be his favorite thing. <laughs> so looking forward to adding music and noises, especially um, to animals. Oh, that's a good idea. Um, animal noises. Oh, that could be funny. Yeah. yeah. That could be funny. Yeah. So I'll just tell you when Alex, I'm going to say this as nicely as I can. When Alex passes gas, and makes a noise, he thinks it's funny and he laughs. OMG, this is going to be so funny to add to his device. He's going to be cracking up. Oh my gosh. Go, Lila. One of the devices that we looked at yesterday, it was one of the Windows based. So it had the games on it. And one of the games was fart sounds. Yes. And you press the buttons and it makes all the different fart sounds with the little blocks. Yes. Yes. We tried it too. And you know, Alex really didn't like it, but maybe he wasn't into fart sounds at the time. I think that's another thing is what is your child like now? And that doesn't mean it's going to be the same a year from now. You might have to change it up. Right. So at the time, I don't even think he was like into fart sounds, but he definitely is now. So I'm thinking that could be appropriate. <laughs> yeah. And I found out with those devices that the ones that are like windows based versus ios based some like the windows ones have the games but the ios based ones don't so even though the software is the same and the brand is the same if it's windows and apple because of all the different contracts that these people make up so like we're not getting any of the games but it doesn't seem like he cares very much but he does love the sound effects and i've got to figure out how to do that when we get the new device <laughs> you'll be able to do the sound effects definitely um, Alex, yeah. asks, do you think that an STX can benefit more? So an STX child can benefit more from eye gaze. Tyson speech therapist always says he's able to use a regular AAC, but his tapping isn't always strong enough to tap on the icon. Can I, can I answer this? Um, so I'm going to unblur myself because Alex, I want you to see Alex's device and, um, you're able to do both eye gaze and tap on his device. So here's, I don't have as many icons as Emma, okay? Alex does not have as many, but I can look at this or I can touch it. Good morning. And then when I, when I touch it, then, so here's the thing. Alex was never good at, at pointing. He was never good at touching until he got his eye gaze device. And now he has a reason to touch something and he tries so hard. I have to kind of steady his hand, but when I steady his hand, he is very sure of what he wants to point to. So he never had that um, motivation to point towards anything until we got the device. So I think that if you get an eye gaze device, it can be used as both and it might be the encouragement that they need to help them to point. It, that's what we've seen. Alex wants to point now. He sticks his hand out. He grabs my hand to help his hand. 
He wants me to help him. And I love it. Like he didn't do that before. Um, but he sees that it's a means of communication now. And he didn't, he didn't understand that before. But I think the, that's awesome. The SLP told us yesterday that when you're looking at the devices, if the ones that come with the eye gaze and the touch, you can get it that way, or you can get a touch with the key guard, but it's an either or. So you can't get the key guard and the eye gaze. Yeah. With the touch. It's this mm -hmm. weird thing. And I'm like, we don't need the key guard. I want the dual thing because we didn't have that on his old device. It was just the touch. Um, I feel like, I feel like though, I, Jen, I feel like you helped me one time or, or, or you looked into this one time. I think there is a company that will make custom key guards. I think there's a company out there that will make the like custom ones. You tell them what device you have, you tell them what, how many icons you want, and they'll make the custom key guard. It, I see, I see Megan shaking her head. There is. Um, yeah. We, when we were originally looking for something for Jamin with our um, speech path from through birth to three, which is our early intervention in West Virginia, we had requested an app um, and our speech path, uh, she knows a company, you have to submit your screen size, your device, the, um, like if you have a protector, you know, a, a case on it, you be the brand of that. Um, and then a screenshot of what your homepage looks like and they will fabricate a, um, a key guard for you. I can get that website and I'll send it to you, um, Melissa, if that's okay. And you could distribute it to whoever wants it. Um, yeah, yeah, I wanna, awesome. uh, yeah, yes, please, please do share that. Um, Alex, I want to go back to what you said too. And, and one thing I would say to that speech therapist is that we want communicating to be as, as easy as possible for him because we want him to want to do it. So, you know, even if he can push, you know, make choices with his hands, if he's not, I mean, think about how frustrating that would be if he knows what he wants. But his hands, and we already know, you know, the brain and the body with STF, STXBP1, they're not communicating with each other, you know, normally. Yeah. So he knows what he wants and he's trying to push that and his hands just aren't doing what he wants it to do. Then he, if he had that eye gaze option as well, then he can still make that choice. And that should be happening for him because if he gets really frustrated, he's going to stop using it. And we do not want that to happen. So that is one thing that I would say to that speech therapist. Yes, insurance, if the school paid for that, that means that that's not really your device, right? So it's like, if he ever leaves that school, he probably won't be able to take that device with him, I would guess. Um, yep. So yeah, so I, yes, I would be wanting your insurance to pay for one. So that is his device. You can do whatever you want with it. It goes everywhere with him. Um, and uh, yeah, that's what I would do. And I would insist that they do the the eye gaze and the being able to touch. I was a way, a way to get the eye gaze though is to say that they have poor motor planning. It's the motor planning that's the problem. Yeah. That's why the eye gaze is preferential. Yeah, yeah. Also, this is what I said. How do you communicate? Look at me right now. How am I communicating? I'm not just speaking. I'm using my hands. I might always also look at something. I might reach out and touch something. We all communicate using different modalities. It is no different for our kids. They're using eye gaze. They might want to point. Why not give them the option to do as many modalities as possible? So why would we limit them to only using their their pointer finger when we know that they could possibly use the eye gaze as well I, I just i don't think you should limit them and if there's any uh, the other thing is that i i know alex uh, um with tyson i don't think you guys have uh, a diagnosis of epilepsy but i but anybody who does have a diagnosis of epilepsy the seizures are going to change their yeah. abil their ability to be able to do things so right now they might be able to use their finger, but if they have a, a whole bunch of seizures, it might, yeah. they might, they might lose that ability for a little while, you know, or, or it might just be a little bit more difficult because the brain's just not working at the, at the speed that it needs to because of the seizures. So I think just stating that you need a mo multi-modality ability for your child, 
You know, I think they shouldn't argue with that. You yeah. know, they, they shouldn't. And, and I agree with Jen, getting it through your insurance, if you can, is really a better option than the school because you own the device. The school, mm -hmm. the school will own the device if you get it through the school. Um, it is not easy to get it through insurance. We were able to, and I know others have been able to, and we're happy to share our experiences with that. Um, in fact, the next question is any experience with medical covering the cost of a device? Yes, we got it covered. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Yep, we did. Medicaid uh, paid for Emma's. Yes. They just told me it's going to take four to six months this time around for us. Yeah. But that yeah. we'll have a loaner device for that time period. Well, that's good. You'll get a loaner. That's, okay, that's we good. We had a loaner while we waited for Emma's as well. Yes. Yeah. Yep. 